All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's not something that is talked about very often. Um, dyscalculia is a specific learning disability, and it makes numerical reasoning and comprehension really challenging for our students. Um, I've become very interested in it since becoming an ABE teacher and teaching math. Um, and I have learned a lot that I'm hoping to share with everybody else. So just so you know who the person talking on the other end of this is, this is me. Um, I have my camera off because everybody in my house works from home. So I'm, I just wanna make sure that the quality of the presentation is good for everybody. Um, a little bit about me. I teach at the correctional facility in Faribault. Um, I'm an upper level math teacher there, GED and ADP. I was actually hired to be a reading teacher. Um, and then I got done with training and they wanted me to teach math. And I was pretty worried I would have to quit my job um, because I have a math learning disability um, that we now call dyscalculia. Uh, so I was pretty concerned about my ability to be able to teach others with math because of my own struggles with it. Um, so I've taken a lot of graduate courses on best teaching practices for students with dyscalculia. Um, I got a math, math specialist certification. That's not a thing in Minnesota, actually. So it's on my licenses in uh, uh, my teaching licenses in other states um, where it is a thing. Um, I have a master's in curriculum design and also a very strong background in developmental psychology, which you might notice a little bit uh, today. Um, and one thing to be very aware of is that I am not a Zoomer. I don't use Zoom very much with my job. We don't use tech very much with my job. So if I am taking an extra second to get anything popped up for everybody, um, please be patient with me. It's not something that I'm incredibly comfortable with. Um, so kind of what you can expect or the roadmap for today is that I'm going to define dyscalculia. Um, I think it's really important to define it because it's so misunderstood. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about some characteristics of it, uh, what you might notice with us, with your students in your classroom. And then finally, a lot of the time I'm going to spend um, talking to you about tools to help your students, uh, like number sense routines, graphic organizers, and tools in general practice that will really help out not only your students uh, who might be struggling with dyscalculia, but anyone with any type of learning challenge. This should help them out. Um, before I dive into it, I would like to do a short, uh, just take a quick temperature of everybody in the presentation. And if you wouldn't mind chatting out on a scale from one to four, one being the least important and four being very important, how important do you think numeracy is for adults? I love seeing all the fours. This is great. <laughs> if you're saying four, and even if you are at a three or in your head, you're at like a two, you know, you're not wrong. Um, another thing I found really interesting when I was doing these graduate courses and doing research and trying to learn a little bit more about myself and why math is a challenge for me. Um, I learned that numeracy is so important for adults and economies. Um, economies lose money when adults don't have a firm grasp on mathematics and numeracy. Um, this just kind of reinforces that fact that teaching them and helping them learn these things uh, is incredibly important. We have bodies of research to support that numeracy is important for adults and it's important for their socioeconomic status. And it's also incredibly important for um, communities and economies. And I just thought that was very, very interesting. 
I'm going to play a short video for everyone. Um, this guy that you see on the screen here is Dr. Daniel Ansari. Um, he's got a master's in psychology and a PhD in neuroscience. And he is one of the biggest names um, when you're looking into dyscalculia. Um, and so I wanted to kind of, I wanted everybody to hear what he had to say about dyscalculia and defining it. Um, because what I often hear from people is like, oh, dyscalculia, that's like dyslexia, but with numbers. Um, and I tend to think that's a little bit misleading because then you might think that your students are just flipping numbers around or numbers are jumping off the page or they're having trouble reading numbers and, and making order with them. Um, and what's happening for people with dyscalculia is a little different than that. Um, if people are describing what I just described, um, I would tend to think that maybe they have dyslexia, which is trouble with reading, because that also includes reading numbers. So if I have a student say that numbers are flipping or jumping around, um, I would tend to ask more questions because I wouldn't immediately think they have dyscalculia. I might think that they have um, dyslexia. So I'm going to play this video of Dr. Daniel Ansari for you. Dyscalculia is often diagnosed when children struggle in school, when they struggle with addition, subtraction, basic math concepts. Underlying dyscalculia is a basic lack of understanding quantities. That's at least what we think right now. That's what the research literature suggests. So what does that look like? So a child with developmental dyscalculia might, for example, struggle comparing which of two numbers is larger or which of two arrays of dots or objects is larger. So they have difficulties discriminating quantities. They're slower at making judgments of relative quantity than typically developing children. So for example, if I show you a group of six apples and three oranges, and I ask you which group of fruit contains more fruit, children with developmental dyscalculia would find that more difficult than children without developmental dyscalculia. They might also struggle when number is represented spatially. So when you use a number line, let's say you have a number line from 0 to 10 and you ask the child to put a hatch mark where the 8 is. Children with dyscalculia may greatly struggle in representing quantity spatially difficulties in understanding quantity and also the links between quantity and symbols lies at the heart of dyscalculia. What do I mean by links between symbols and quantity? What I mean by that is if I show you an array of five dots and then show you the numeral seven and the numeral five and I ask you which of these numerals represents the set of dots, children with developmental dyscalculia would struggle to give the correct answer. And that is because they have a poor understanding of the link between symbols and quantities. But it can go deeper than that. Children with dyscalculia may also have difficulties understanding the relationships between symbols. So they may have difficulties understanding the rank order of a symbol or the relationship between symbols. So for example, if you show a child with developmental dyscalculia a group of five oranges and then you show them the number word five and the number word nine and you ask them which number word connects to that set. Children with developmental dyscalculia might struggle to give you that answer quickly and efficiently. And then you can imagine how these difficulties with quantity and making the links between symbols and quantity eventually lead to difficulties in learning how to add and subtract. Because when you add, you need to activate the quantities associated with the numbers that you're adding together. If I, for example, show you three numbers, one, two, three, and ask you, are these in order or not? It's a very simple uh, question, but children with dyscalculia often struggle with things that assess their understanding of the order of numbers as well. Deficits in quantity processing is a major hallmark of developmental dyscalculia. Um, so I just want to address a couple of things um, with this. Uh, if you noticed, uh, Dr. Ansari talked a lot about children 
with dyscalculia. Um, that's because most of the body of research is focused on children and nothing I've read to date focuses on adults. Um, you know, this means that as practitioners of adult education, uh, we, we have a big challenge. We kind of have to bridge that gap between what research is telling us about how it presents in children um, and, and the tools that help children. We have to figure out how to apply that to our adult learners or how this might look different with our adult learners and an adult population. Um, so there's a large, there's a big direction that research needs to go. Um, so, so I think that's just fascinating in and of itself too, that we, we already do a lot of work like that within our field. And I think with math, we have an even bigger job to do just because we don't have any studies on adults with a math learning disability. Um, also, I think adults have learned incredible coping mechanisms. Um, and so a, a lot of the time, it could be hard to tell that they have dyscalculia, or you might have to ask a lot of questions to figure out if, if that's what their difficulty is, because they've managed to make their way in the world while having this learning disability um, and maybe not getting a lot of the supports that they've needed. Um, I'm going to have uh, a podcast shared into the chat um, for, uh, from Dr. Daniel Ansari. Uh, I think it's really fascinating listening to his podcasts. I love even reading transcripts of a lot of the talks he's done on dyscalculia. Like I said, um, he's the biggest voice within everything that I've read. He cites a lot of other really fascinating research. Um, some of it's pretty old. It goes back to like 1993. Um, and, and if you do any type of research, uh, you know that we try to get articles within the last five or 10 years when we're doing things. Um, so it, it sort of just tells me that a lot of this stuff needs to be updated and that we as teachers um, are really doing a lot of work. Um, and I hope that they continue to do more research so that we can do a little bit less. Let's see. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the DSM-5 definition of dyscalculia. Um, so if you've never heard of the DSM, it's a, a diagnostic manual, diagnostic and statistic manual. Uh, we're on the fifth edition of it. This is something that psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose um, learning disabilities and mental illness and things of that nature. Um, so in the DSM-5, developmental dyscalculia follow, falls under this umbrella term called a specific learning disorder. Um, and the definition in the DSM-5 states that a specific learning disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder of biological origin manifested in learning difficulty and problems in acquiring academic skills markedly below age level. Um, one of the things I want you to notice about that, and I highlighted it, is um, that the DSM-5 states it's of biological origin. I think that's really important to note that it's something with the brain or brain chemistry. And they're still doing a little bit of research to try to figure out what area of the brain is causing dyscalculia. And I think that's fa fascinating um, because it can be tied to a lot of other things. Um, it's also important to note that um, something that wasn't in the DSM-4, I actually went back into my diagnostic manual and looked at this. Something that wasn't in the DSM-4 is that this has to last for at least six months. Um, so in order for a proper diagnosis to take place, um, it has to be either a doctor or a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but they also have to do screening over a very long period of time in order to confidently diagnose this. Um, so it can take a while to get children or adults or whomever the help that they need. Okay, 
And then under specific learning disorder, um, they have to specify whether it's an impairment in reading, which is what we'd call dyslexia, um, an impairment in written expression. Um, that's not dyspraxia, that's, I'm blanking on the name of that one right now, or an impairment with mathematics, which is what we call dyscalculia. Um, in prior versions of this diagnostic manual, it was known as a math learning disorder. So if you're ever doing any reading online um, and they talk about a math learning disorder, yes, thank you, dysgraphia. That was going to bug me if I didn't get that. I appreciate that, Kathy. Um, so if you're reading online about a math learning disorder, that is what they called dyscalculia prior to this DSM-5. Um, and then note even further that they break that down into difficulty with number sense, which is fact and calculation, or with general mathematical reasoning. So there are different skill sets that this can affect. So my really easy definition of it is that it's a learning disability uh, where people struggle with math concepts or skills. Um, and this is a little bit more blurry of an image, but it goes over a lot of um, the traits or the hallmarks that you can see in somebody who might be, might be struggling uh, with dyscalculia. Um, if you were to look up the symptoms, the list is really, really extensive because dyscalculia presents differently from person to person. Um, one person with dyscalculia may really, really struggle with number sense, and that's often the area most people with number sense, um, people with uh, dyscalculia do struggle with, um, but they might do well in data and statistics. Another person with dyscalculia might do fine at certain areas of number sense and poorly in other areas of number sense. So you can, you can Google this and go onto a page and it'll give you like 50 different things to look at. And I wouldn't expect to see every single one present within your students. Um, some of the main symptoms of dyscalculia though, typically have to do with number sense or skills learned really early in math. So place value can be really challenging. Um, comparing numbers, less than, greater than, equal to. Uh, the commutative property, so knowing that three plus two is the same thing as two plus three, that's a pretty challenging thing. Uh, multiplication facts, fun story. As a person with dyscalculia and a math teacher, it's pretty embarrassing, but I'm very bad with my um, multiplication facts. I still need a calculator to help me out. Sometimes I'm somewhat confident that I know them, but it's nice having that crutch there just to make sure. Um, and I know that a lot of students with dyscalculia feel the same way. Retrieval of those facts, um, for whatever reason, is very, very difficult. Um, another thing you might notice is that finding and seeing patterns can be really hard. And, and not just with numbers, but uh, general patterns, like um, if you were to order something green, blue, red, green, blue, red, and ask somebody with dyscalculia what comes next, they might have trouble recognizing that pattern right there, um, which then translates over to math because math is a lot of pattern recognition. Um, counting by twos, threes, or fives can be really challenging, um, or even navigating on a number line, which I think uh, he had mentioned in that video. Um, spatial awareness is also really tough, so I kind of have funny stories about that. Um, if somebody says something like, that dog is 10 feet away, um, that's really difficult for someone with dyscalculia to envision because they don't really have a concept or understanding of like what a foot is, let alone 10 feet. Um, and I get this a lot when I'm driving. So if somebody says, okay, you need to turn right in three blocks, 
um, that's actually a challenge for me to do um, because I like having the visual of the map on the screen in my car and keeping the GPS up and being able to see it is a lot more helpful. But if you're telling me like turn right in three blocks, um, I, I almost get a little bit anxious because I'm like, okay, three blocks. I promise you I can count, but like visualizing that is a really big challenge for me. Um, even when I go to like baby showers and stuff like that, and those things where they put like a bunch of candies in a jar and you have to guess how many are in there, that's, that's a pretty challenging thing for someone with dyscalculia to do. You, you don't have like the concept of how much space one piece of candy is taking up um, in order to even be able to make some type of estimate for the rest of it. Um, you might notice that these students seem to lose track of time or be disorganized. Um, that's because they have trouble telling time or keeping track of time or misremembering dates. Um, I know that I have to triple check the time. Like today for this presentation, I had to check the time so many times to make sure that I would be here on time. And I've got it written in a bunch of different places. Um, but people with dys dyscalculia need a lot of tools to help them with that type of organization and to keep things straight. Um, so it really might seem like your students with dyscalculia are being forgetful or just not listening or paying attention at all and they get their information mixed up. Um, but the truth is that the concept of times and dates uh, is really important to keep track of. And so helping your students with organization might actually be a really simple way to help with their dyscalculia. Um, I, I don't think a lot of people would be able to tell that I struggle with these types of things because I am so organized, but you really find yourself having to overcompensate because it's something that's challenging for you. Let's see, I'm just checking my notes to make sure that I'm not forgetting anything important I wanted to tell everybody. This is another thing, like notes are really important um, because of that organization aspect. And I find that I have to do a lot of these things for myself. Justine, did so, you want me to drop the link to that article? Yes, please, thank you. Good. Um, so this article I just wanted to share with everybody because um, basically every graduate course that I took on dyscalculia led me to this website. This is what the teachers used when they were teaching us the material. Um, this is where they found, this is where I found a lot of the information for this presentation. And this is where you can find a lot of information about symptoms um, and about different supports for your students. So I've found it really, really helpful. Okay, and just some general things. Um, between five and 10% of the population may have dyscalculia. Um, the prevalence is then really comparable to dyslexia. But the problem there is that we have a lot more studies about dyslexia than we do about dyscalculia. So I would put a lot more confidence in the rates for dyslexia than it would for dyscalculia. Um, the other reason that this might be uh, underestimated is because of what I said earlier, we didn't really call it dyscalculia until fairly recently, I would say within the last nine or 10 years. Um, before that, we called it a mathematics learning disorder or MLD. Um, so so uh, they haven't really bundled those together to figure out exactly how much of the population is affected by this. Um, so for every 14 publications on dyslexia, 
there's only one on dyscalculia. Um, so dyscalculia is really an area that they're still trying to understand. And it's just, it's super underdiagnosed at this point in time. Um, if people have dyscalculia, they probably have other cognitive impairments. They might have other learning disabilities. They might have um, ADHD. It, it can be comorbid with a lot of things. Um, so 20 to 60% of people with dyscalculia have other diagnosed conditions. Um, I, the range in that percentage just floors me um, because I always try to think about it um, like eating a pizza. And if somebody told me they ate 20% of a pizza, I'd be like, oh, it's pretty reasonable. But if they told me they had 60% of a pizza, I'd be like, that's a lot of pizza. So the fact that our, the fact that our numbers range this much um, just kind of proves my point that we don't have a big enough body of research at this point in time. Um, that's good and bad. It's good because it means there's a lot of directions that we can go. It's exciting for the future. Um, but it's bad because it means that it leaves us to do a lot of the legwork to help people with dyscalculia. Um, somebody in the chat's asking if there's any correlation with people within the autism spectrum. I have not read that in any of my research. Um, that's not to say there isn't, but I didn't read anything about that. Uh, the last bullet there, I put on there because it was interesting to me um, on a personal level that there may be a connection between dyscalculia and the inability to read music. Um, I've never been able to read music. My parents always put me into like piano lessons um, and music classes. And I, I could never do it because I couldn't read the music. It, and it was so challenging for me because I was a great reader and everything in general. And I practiced and I tr tried and it just wouldn't stick in my brain. Um, so this makes me curious about when they do kind of narrow down the area of the brain in future research, if, if those are in a similar area of the brain. I'm going to play this video of a kid in 10th grade um, talking about their experience with dyscalculia. Um, I'm showing you this video because that's the oldest student they interviewed. Um, but I'm going to have two other videos in the chat shared in case you have any interest um, of a first grade and a sixth grade student sharing their experiences as well. Um, I think it's good for us to hear about people's experiences um, when they struggle with dyscalculia, because like I said, it does present a little bit different for everybody. Um, and it is a little embarrassing to admit that you have dyscalculia and describe what that struggle is like for you. So I think it's very important that we listen to people's story, stories. My name is Sam. And math is a huge struggle for me. When I looked at a math problem, what I saw was just, oh my god, what the heck is this? I don't understand. I don't understand. And that was just made me furious. It made me really sad because, I, I mean, no one likes to not understand things. When I'm out with friends and I'm trying to make change at restaurants and stuff or at stores, I can't. I'm just like, hey, can you do this? I mean, socially, some people would just be like, oh, Sam is stupid. They, they wouldn't care to look any further into who I was. They would just say, Sam is stupid. Done. Period. And that hurt. Math can be very difficult for a lot of students. And for children with math issues, once they've reached the upper grades, that frustration they've experienced has been mounting. Children who are in middle school or high school who continue to have math issues bring with them this history of multiple frustrations and tension. And that just makes the math problem solving even more difficult. So in these students, we need to address not only the difficulties, whether it's difficulty retrieving math facts or whatever, but also the attitudes and the feelings that they bring to math class and how they internalize what math means to them. So we need to give them opportunities for 
math success. We need to give them extra time if that's what they need. We need to help them um, develop their math concepts, but we also have to help them connect math to their lives in a meaningful way, whether it's recognizing the role of math in their favorite sport or in the job that they hope to get after high school. We need to help kids develop not only good math skills, but a really healthy attitude about mathematics. My parents didn't understand my struggles with math, and I didn't understand why I didn't get math. There was a lot of confusion, because it felt like in those moments, no one would understand me. Ninth grade, and I was totally failing at math, which led to me having to do it over the summer. We, who would want their summer to be taken up by something they hate, like math? The real reason I got through this summer math experience was this man named Mr. Tran. He was a great teacher. When dealing with Mr. Tran, I always wanted to make him happy too. I wanted to do things for myself, but I also wanted to do things for him because I knew he believed in me and I would dare not let him down. So I pushed on through math, pushed on and pushed on. I, myself, got an A, something totally unheard of for the realm of math. I still look back at that and I'm incredibly proud. And if I can over overcome such a big challenge like that, then I believe I can overcome anything. So that video for me just re reinforced a couple of things. Um, it's really embarrassing for people with dyscalculia, but we also have a lot of power as teachers uh, to change that and help students feel more confident and, and learn the material. Um, so the bulk of what I'm gonna be talking about today is what we're shifting into now, which is supports for our students. Um, in my notes, I noted that I came across a lot of computer programs out there that were created to help students with dyscalculia. Uh, I saw that they were used at a lot of universities the problem is that all of them cost a really significant amount of money. Um, so <laughs> I, it was like, well, I can't pay for them to evaluate them and tell people whether or not they'd be beneficial in an adult education setting. Um, so rather than focusing on things like that that are out there, um, I really focused on free or very low cost strategies and also low prep strategies that you can use to assist your students in the classroom. So as we're going through a lot of these, you're probably gonna think that they're really duh type things. Um, but that's because truly the supports needed aren't like grand or unreasonable on any level. You don't have to do a lot to support your students who are struggling with dyscalculia. Um, really basic things will help them out a lot. So the first thing is that you kind of have to think about what people with dyscalculia are lacking. Um, primarily, it's number sense. So the most important thing that I feel teachers could do within their classroom is some type of number sense routine and do it on a very regular basis. Lots of different types of number sense routines to get your students thinking about um, numbers in different ways every single day. So this is a number sense routine that I, I do pretty often in my classroom. It's just a little math puzzle. Um, so this helps students with dyscalculia and all your other students actually, they kind of view it as a game. Um, it helps them look at, the, at numbers in a different way. Uh, these pictures are a little bit less intimidating. Um, they can notice other things other than what numeric value might be assigned to each of these pictures. Um, but often it creates a really like team atmosphere in your classroom. And even students who struggle with that number sense or numeric reasoning um, are having conversations with their classmates about numbers and it is helping build that number sense for them. Um, a question I've gotten when I've done webinars or other presentations before 
Um, and I've talked about this idea of doing math puzzles in the classroom is, does it have to tie into my daily lesson? I don't think so. No, <laughs> I think this gets people confident and thinking and um, ready for your class. Um, it helps them verbalize their problem solving skills and it just helps them learn that basic number sense. So the resource that I got this from is Mashup Math and, and Patsy shared that in the chat for you. They have lots of free puzzles on there. Um, I've also noticed a lot of these types of puzzle, puzzles shared on like social media. I'll normally just copy paste them and put them up on the board in my class and ask my students what they think and if they want to solve it with me. Um, I very rarely solve these ahead of time. Uh, I like being part of the problem solving process with them. I like asking them how they got something. I like comparing my answers and I'll go, ah, I agree with you. Or, oh, I don't really agree. How'd you get that? Um, and promoting a lot of conversation and discourse when you're doing these is what's really important. Does anybody have any questions about this puzzle in particular at all? Good question. Um, it just works like a basic multiplication grid. And so I would just ask my students if they could try to figure out the value of any picture on here. And I let them lead the way. So normally they try to start with the first, and this leads to chaos, just so you know, and that's kind of my teaching, that's, that's my pedagogy. I kind of just let there be some chaos in my classroom and I've learned to be very comfortable with it. Um, Typically what students will do is they will try to solve that waffle first. They won't look at the waffle on the far right. They'll look at that very first box and they'll be like, one times waffle is waffle. That waffle could be anything. And then they get a little mad about it. And I'm like, yeah, if it could be anything, do you think we can start there? Um, and they eventually go, well, no. And I'm like, well, what is something where we have all of the information needed? And it can take a while, especially if they're new to the concept of doing a number sense routine like this, but eventually they'll land on, I think it's a syrup bottle. Please correct me if you think that's something else. I think it's a syrup bottle. And they know, okay, a number times itself has to equal 25. What number times itself equals 25? okay, syrup bottle has to be five, right? Thank you, I thought it was a syrup bottle. We get in arguments in my classroom about what the pictures are too. And I encourage you to let that chaos happen um, and let your students argue like about what the picture actually is as well, even if they're not talking about numbers, because that's allowing them to have some fun in your classroom and like feel comfortable, even if they're not yet comfortable to talk about numbers. So let the chaos happen. Um, when you figure out that syrup bottle is five, you might know that one times five is five. So orange juice also has to be five. You might figure out that two times five is 10. So strawberry has to be 10. And you use this process of elimination to figure out the values of each of these pictures. Um, this mashup math website has some that are easy and it has some that are a little bit more difficult. So if you feel like this is, if you're introducing this for the first time to your students, use an easier puzzle. And as they get a grasp on it, um, I start giving them the more challenging ones. Typically each puzzle, themed puzzle has three levels of difficulty, easy, medium, and challenging. Um, and just feel out what your class can do and give them that. Sometimes when I feel like I've given too many challenging puzzles in a row, I'll give them an easier one just to rebuild that confidence and that discourse before giving them something a little bit more challenging. Um, Mashup Math also has puzzles that look like this. Really similar concept. You are trying to figure out the value 
of each of these pictures. And while students are talking with each other, they are talking about a lot of different things. They're talking about algebra. They're talking about order of operations. They're talking about a lot of different things. I love it because I have this up on my board and my students are working on this even when I'm taking attendance and doing all of my stuff I have to do at the beginning of class. So it gets them thinking immediately when they come into the room and it gets them talking immediately about math and it gets that energy up for the class period. Um, I love this because they verbalize their thinking, they work collaboratively, and they have really meaningful conversations and questions, even if they're trying to figure out like what the theme of the puzzle is. Like, I think this is like fairy tale or something like that, but they love arguing about stuff like that. And I think that's great. Uh, I think students have fun and fun can't be discounted at all. Uh, it's a huge factor in motivation and students will do something if they see value in it or simply if they think it's fun. And opening up your class with something like this allows them to get into that right headspace. Uh, the final reason I think a puzzle like this is really important um, is because I think it's really equitable. I think it's approachable for all my students. There isn't anything intimidating about it. There's access points all over the place. Um, you don't have to talk about the pictures in term of, terms of numbers. That's the ultimate goal, obviously. But again, if they want to talk about like, what is the theme of these pictures today, Miss Hill? Like one of them is um, all the makings of a grilled cheese, right? Um, if they want to get talking about the pictures and the themes and stuff like that, that's really awesome. Yes, I agree. I think it's awesome for um, English learners. I think it provides access points and makes everything equitable. Um, this is, a, I think, a medium level puzzle that you might see from those free puzzles on his website. Um, and in order to solve it, you kind of have to look at the information on the third line to know that the frog and the castle are the same, because then what number added to itself three times is 36. Students don't always get that right away. They might be using their fingers. They might be on their calculator testing out different numbers. Um, encourage that, let them count on their fingers, let them use calculators, let them try out different numbers. Students with dyscalculia have trouble recalling math facts. So for them, three times 12 is 36 is not apparent. Um, and letting them access that information through trial and error is not a bad thing. Um, and then once they have that, they kind of start having the building blocks to solve these puzzles and, and talk about all of these really fun mathy concepts. Any questions about these puzzles before I go to another number sense routine? Excellent. Another thing that I really like doing is think, notice, wonder. Um, there's no numbers on the warm up slide at all. This allows students to ask a lot of questions about the picture. And maybe they'll pick up on patterns. Maybe they'll ask questions that relate to numbers. Maybe they'll just go, wow, that's a lot of apartments. Um, but eventually they might start asking how many apartments, what portion of the image is one apartment, how many stories is the building, how tall is it, um, how many stairs do you have to climb to get to the top, how many people might live here, um, and getting them to use the information they see in the picture to answer their own questions is a really great way to approach math without there being a right or wrong answer. If you get two students who answer their own questions differently, ask them why, ask them to explain their thought process um, and have them engage in that discourse. Think, notice, wonder, you can throw up almost any photo onto your um, screen 
and people will inevitably have conversations. Um, and these conversations point in a lot of really great math directions. Um, some of these questions can be answered with certainty and some of them might allow for multiple answers and that's kind of part of the fun of it. Uh, another number sense routine that I sometimes do is would you rather? And I'll pop up something like this and just have students answer and then explain why. And it's really fun listening to all of their different answers. I don't have a source for where I got this because I've had this in my puzzle slides for five or six years now. Um, but if you just search, I think if you just did a Google search of um, math, would you rather, a lot of puzzles come up because I know that I have tons stored in my lessons and it leads to as you can see you can look at this a lot of different ways um, they're dealing with area they're dealing with fractions um, some of the would you rathers deal with proportions percents and things like that most of them are really dealing with those again those number sense things that people with dyscalculia struggle with and the biggest thing you can do to help somebody with dyscalculia is help build up that number sense. Another thing that might not seem, hey, thank you, Marcy, and I'm happy to see you here. Uh, a number, another thing that you might not think of as a number sense routine, but it definitely is, are just general brain teasers that you get on the internet um, or magazines or periodicals. Um, for example, in this picture right here, it doesn't look overly mathematical, but it can help students to develop pattern recognition. So this one just comes from um, Reader's Digest, and it's it, I would ask students to tell me how many triangles are in this picture. Um, I have a smart board, and so typically they go up and they grab the pens and they start drawing on there to try to figure out how many triangles there are. Um, and a lot of the time when they're solving this, I might leave this up for a couple of days too, because I'll go, eh, I don't have the same number as you, but I want you to keep trying. Um, a lot of the time, eventually they do realize that there is some sort of pattern and that they don't have to count every single individual triangle. So it's helping them build that up. Um, so eventually, if they're really struggling with it, we might show something like this or I'll draw it on the board. Finding this picture was a little bit easier than me drawing on the PowerPoint. Um, but you can think of using all sorts of things in your classroom to help build pattern recognition. Um, different colored post-its, uh, shoes, if they have different brand shoes, um, and they want to make patterns out of that. If your students have water bottles and they want to make patterns out of the variety of water bottles and explain why their pattern makes sense or what would come next in the pattern, um, they can then apply that ability to create and identify patterns to numbers later on. Um, identifying what comes next in a sequence. So if there was another level to this triangle, how many triangles would there be then? Helping them kind of develop what comes next in a sequence and helping them develop that pattern recognition will help them with a lot of their math stuff later. Okay, this is probably the least popular thing that I'm gonna share um, with number sense routines. Uh, it is drills. Um, we, we often strive for this idyllic classroom where we're doing a lot of authentic real world learning. Um, but in order for some of that to be accessible, we might need to do the old fashioned drill and kill um, to help our students 
recall facts and retain things. Um, and repetitive practice is one of those ways that we need to do that. Um, steps for solving problems are not always easy to follow or recall. So practicing the process with many different supports or crutches in place is very helpful and crucial for students with dyscalculia. Um, so these are just a few programs that I use. Working in corrections, I don't have access to a ton of programs. So if you have programs or websites that you go to to get worksheets to help with repetitive practice, please feel free to share with everybody in the chat. Um, and I'll save uh, the chat at the end of this and add it in. So um, if we can share resources out to people later that you're wanting, um, this can kind of be a place where all that stuff is if teachers here have resources that they use outside of what I'm sharing. So that leads me to, if anybody would like to share either in the chat or unmute what number sense routines they use in their classroom, um, chances are your number sense routines are just as good as my go-tos and are super helpful for your students. And so if you wanna share with our group what you do, and if they think that would be plausible in their classroom, that would be fantastic. If people think of things as the presentation goes on, feel free to add it. Something might spark something for you to share. Ooh, I like the which one doesn't belong. Yes, that's a great one for students with dyscalculia. I'll definitely be adding a slide on that. Thank you. Good, math worksheets for kids can add that. Good. Um, the next supports that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to go through kind of quickly because I think uh, people have seen or used them before, um, but it, I think they're a good reminder just for teachers to be aware that these are things that can really, really help your students. Graphic organizers are huge. Um, if you think about my example earlier of how I kind of sweat if somebody tells me to turn right in three blocks, but if I see the map of it in my car and I can like visually look at it, apply that to like everything for people with dyscalculia. Um, being able to visually see something is really important and having like a picture or breaking stuff down into a graphic organizer um, is incredibly helpful. Even my students know that when they ask me a question, I often have to write what they're saying so that I can visually organize it in a way that I understand. And I always tell them it's not because you're asking a dumb question or anything like that. It's because my brain processes this differently. And so I have to look at it differently in order to be able to help you. Um, I think it's been valuable for them seeing that process. But I think it's just also valuable to remind teachers that um, these visuals are often like the key between success and failure. So color-coded notes, these are notes that a student of mine made. I didn't make them. Um, but you can tell they color-coded everything really nicely to formulas to help them understand which piece belonged where. Um, when they did this, it was really helpful for me even. I loved it. Uh, another graphic organizer that you might not think to use in a math classroom, but it's totally helpful in a math classroom is the Freyer model. Um, so I put a blank one here uh, so that folks are able to get it at a later time or screenshot it if they need to. Um, and on the next slide, I have an example of what it might look like. Also, I'm loving everybody sharing everything in the chat. Like I said, I'm going to save all this and add it to this presentation so it can be kind of a resource of all of these um, 
a resource of resources for everybody. Um, so this is how you might use the Freire model uh, in the math classroom. It really just breaks down the information into different sections for your students. It gives them a definition. It gives them examples. It has them describe it on their own. Um, that's very important. Seeing the information in a lot of different ways, I can't describe how helpful that is for me. Another thing is that you could use this as a step-by-step -step graphic organizer. Um, often a lot of the stuff that we do in math class follows really concrete steps. Um, the steps for solving certain problems can be really easy to mix up or remember for a student with dyscalculia. Um, and so having something like this where they can break it down is really important. Um, and it's also really important for them to be able to break it down in their own words. So I would hand this to them as like a note taking sheet and I wouldn't necessarily have everything broken down for them, but this is how they could solve their problems. You can give them a list of the steps and then they can show their work for each step in each one of these boxes. And again, it might seem like a really well duh type of thing, um, but having it broken down like that and having a system for organizing is, is really pretty crucial. This is just an example of how I show students the steps for um, doing a particular type of problem in my classroom. All of my lessons have, um, or I guess all of my assignments have uh, instruction packets that go with them that try to break down each skill into steps. And then I hand them that graphic organizer, this one right here, and they have to show how they did each step in the boxes. So you can see I have one, two, three steps here for creating a dot plot. Um, and then I would ask them to use this graphic organizer here to create their own dot plot when they go to their assignment packet. This is something that we use a lot in math, graph paper, grid paper. Um, rather than having like regular old scratch paper, um, grid paper is really fantastic for students with dyscalculia. Um, they can use one box for most numbers and symbols. Um, if they're solving for an equation, they can make sure that the equal sign stays in the same column each time. Um, I noticed that a lot of my students have difficulty lining up their work and simply using the grid paper to make sure everything stays aligned when they're dropping information down from a previous line is really, really helpful. And it also like eliminates the chance of them excluding a number because sometimes I'll look at their work and I'll go, well, you had four on this line and now four isn't on this line. Um, this also could allow them to align things in each row by place value. Um, so it's actually a little bit better to use grid paper than it is to use lined paper um, because those vertical lines help just as much as those horizontal lines, as you can kind of see with these examples here. And here's another example of how it might look with some equations. And you can see that the, like the equals sign stays in the same column the whole time. Numbers are being dropped down in the same column the whole time. And this is a really like easy way to help with that organization aspect. This is the graphic organizer that I call break it down. <laughs> uh, 
Um, it's really just getting students to, it's, it's used a lot for word problems. Um, it's really getting students to try to pick out the important information within a word problem. So they write down the word problem or, you know, cut it out and glue it into that top box. Um, and in the second box, they got to write down what they know. Typically, I have students do this by like circling numbers and putting a squiggly line underneath unit labels because that kind of helps them figure out. Um, we talk about keywords such as like how much or how many and then looking at the unit label after that to kind of help them figure out what they're supposed to be solving for so that um, yellow box in the bottom right what do you need to find okay so what keywords do we look for when we're trying to figure out what do we need to find um so this is kind of what it can look like this is obviously a little bit more sophisticated than like what a typical student would do this is like a primary example um, but having it broken down into these small tasks so that they're not just overwhelmed by looking at the word problem, I think is really, really helpful. Um, there's a question in the, in the chat asking, have you found that the structure of this, the grid is overwhelming for some of the students with cal dyscalculia or more helpful? Um, my students love being given grid paper, even students without dyscalculia. Um, find that they're able to organize their work a little bit better with the grid paper. Some still prefer blank or lined paper, and that's totally okay. Um, but a lot of students, even if I don't suspect that they have dyscalculia, have really benefited from using grid paper as scratch paper. Um, but if it doesn't work for them, I always tell them, like, it's your learning, and if this doesn't work for the way your brain thinks, um, feel free to go to the strategy that works best for you. Uh, and that's, that's my approach with everything really, to be honest with you. I'm always like, you know, I might explain it one way, but the guy sitting next to you might explain it a different way. And if you understand what he's saying better than you understand what I'm saying, you can feel free to listen to him as long as you're getting to the right answer in the end and you can explain yourself. Um, so that's just kind of what goes with my, my teaching style. So those are the main graphic organizers that I use. And once again, um, if you have other graphic organizers that you use and that you have found helpful in your classroom, I would really love it if you shared with folks in the chat um, or if you prefer unmuting and talking about it, go ahead and do that. because uh, we all kind of have different things that we do. And I think that every single person here does a really, I've, I'm seeing a lot of like familiar names and I'm like, oh, you all do such good things. I love it. Um, so chances are what you're doing already is probably super effective. Okay, the last really basic thing that I want to talk about are just tools and um, general classroom practice that uh, are really helpful for students with dyscalculia. Um, one of the biggest things I like to note is, is calculators. Um, I almost get sad when teachers are like, oh, I don't let my students use calculators. Um, because for me, that gives me lots of anxiety. I can be a really great problem solver, um, but my ability to retrieve math facts or sometimes do the basic math takes a really long time and makes that anxiety mount. And I can solve a problem in front of me if I have the necessary tools and a calculator is one of those things. Um, a multiplication table, uh, is another really powerful thing 
multiplication tables at the same time can also be sort of overwhelming. So the other thing I've found um, is having multiplication tables for like each number up in the classroom or in a notebook for a student. Um, and then, like I said, something that I provide for all my students are step-by-step -step instructions or examples so that they always have something to follow along with. Um, if I open up a different window, I'll be able to show that to you. I'll wait until I talk about these other things to do that because I'm nervous about my technology ability here. Um, really basic things like extra time on tests, uh, checking their classwork frequently just to make sure that they're on track um, making sure your worksheets are really straightforward and there's not like a bunch of clutter on there or giving like fewer problems at a time to look at. Um, I know students who I've suspected of having dyscalculia in the past, if I give them a page with just two problems at a time, they do really well rather than being given like the whole six page assignment with three problems on each page, and they just turn in each page as they get it done. Um, allowing students to use their fingers and draw out questions and try to visualize things in whatever way. Um, allowing students to talk with one another. Like I said, I might say something in one way, but I might have a student or a tutor or a substitute teacher say something in a completely different way and that resonates better with my students. So allowing that peer discussion of questions and things like that is super important. Um, using like colored pencils or markers or highlighters to kind of help pick out different information is really important. Um, working with manipulatives uh, this isn't something I do a lot with, but I think is very effective. And I know a lot of teachers who do. Um, so using those like tape diagrams, uh, number lines, um, like 3D shapes to demonstrate things, all of that is very, very helpful. And if you have other general practice things that you do, Share in the chat. I'm going to try to go to a different window just to show you, um, give you an example of what my step by step instructions look like. Can everybody see this? Yes. Excellent. Oops, that's not the button I meant to hit though. Here. So just step-by-step -step instructions for like how to use a calculator with a visual picture of the calculator. Or having a sheet like this that explains and shows how to plug information into a formula so that they can look at an example while they're working. Um, I have these for every single topic that I teach. And this is probably the most, honestly, the most impractical thing that I'm showing you today. I think everything else is like really easy, grab and go, low prep for teachers. It has taken me a really long time to develop this for all of my lessons. Um, but I've seen such tremendous student growth since making this for all of my lessons. My students love reading through, I call them the instruction packets. Um, they love reading through the instruction packets. They love following along with the steps. Um, they ask really valuable mathematical questions as they're reading it. And it's allowing them, it's giving them time to like process what all of these steps are and what exactly they're doing and how the, ra the radius is related to the diameter, for example. Um, having this available to them 
to look at after I do lessons on the board is super valuable. And I have seen tape score growth. I've seen growth in confidence with my students. Um, it's, it's time consuming to make all of this, but it has been just so important for the growth of my students. So I just kind of wanted to share what a couple slides of that look like, but I, there are like hundreds of slides of those that I've worked on over the years. Um, and I almost, I kind of, I'll be honest, I had to do that for myself though too, um, because like I said, as a teacher who has dyscalculia, I had to break it down in that way for me to be able to understand it well enough to teach it to other people. Um, so it was almost something that I had to do for me, but it's turned out to really benefit my students. And with that, that is all I have for folks today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Although I've lost the chat at this moment, so... Yeah, if people have questions for Justine, feel free to unmute and ask. And we do have a couple of announcements, so don't leave yet, but um, wanted to give a little space for questions. Could I ask you, to briefly repeat what you were showing in the slides about how you prepare for a class and how it's so beneficial. Sure. So, sorry. Let me get to the correct one. Um, so, for example, um, when I'm trying to figure out how to teach, like, the rules of exponents or something like that, okay. I first think about all of the vocabulary involved mm -hmm. and how you even read exponents. Um, I try to think of all the misconceptions. So, like with exponents, a common one that students think is like, if it's four squared, they think, oh, it's four times two. <laughs> um, uh -huh. I try to think of things like that. And then I create these slides um, with notes like that on there. So you'll notice for this slide right here that I talk about the different vocabulary. What's the base? What's the exponent? How do you read this when you're reading it in a math equation or in some type of problem? And then I write it out. You can read x to the second power as x to the power of two, x to the second, x squared. That's not stuff that our students might know or remember. Um, and so it's helpful for them to see that. And then below in the box, you can see an example, six to the fourth or six to the power of four, six is the base and four is the exponent. And so they can start to tie this vocabulary to these things. And then I talk about the misconception right there. So this might, means that six should be multiplied by itself four times. So six times six times six times six not that we're taking six times four. Um, you might think your students are going to remember that when you say it at the board. They won't. <laughs> so it's much better if I have it in this instruction packet for them to look at and reference as they're working on the daily assignment. So you can see at the top, I tell them what page their assignment is on um, as well. I kind of have everything numbered for my classroom. And then each slide after this goes over the rules that they might see for that assignment. So how do you solve an exponent when they're to the power of zero or if the exponent is a negative number? My slides go over all of that and provide examples in them. 
so that students can see what that might look like and they have something to follow along with when they're doing their own assignment. Um, I would love to say that they take perfect notes and remember everything I'm saying at the board because I'm so funny and entertaining while I'm teaching. Uh, but the truth is they have memory recall issues, um, whether it's due to anxiety, whether it's due to dyscalculia or other factors. Um, and so providing them tools like this to follow along with along with maybe a graphic organizer for them to help organize their own work uh, has really given me a lot of success within my classroom. So I've developed these guides that go with all of their assignments. Um, and that way it's, it's basically like teacher notes. Um, and then what I have them do as well is I have them take their own handwritten notes um, so that way they're not just reading what I'm saying, but they're putting things into their own words. And then they can use those handwritten notes while they're taking the test. So they can't use any of the materials I've made, but if they've managed to put something into their own words, I let them use that. Um, and you obviously know that they can't have those notes in the TAME testing room. But having these examples to follow and then writing things in their own words, um, I believe has led them to really big growth with the tape scores. I've seen a lot of success with that. Wow, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. Yeah, good, good for us to be thinking about that vocabulary and all those stumbling blocks. Yeah, thank you. People get frustrated at times over them. Thank you so much. Really yeah, good. not a problem. So there is another question in the chat, and I have one that I want to add to it. So um, Jennifer is asking, would you mind sharing your instruction packet? And also, so answering that, but then also with the instruction packet, and I'm sorry if I just missed this, um, at what point do you hand that out? Is it at the beginning of a topic? I know students can write their own notes after they see it, but like when when do you hand that out? Right away. I think it helps with like the anxiety. I think they like having something to follow along with when I'm talking at the board too. And I kind of reference it when I'm talking at the board. I'll be like, you'll notice on slide whatever of the instruction packet that I say this, make note of that. Like, I, you kind of have to teach, I, I've found that I have to like teach them explicitly a lot of the study skills that I think they should just be doing. And so I hand it out right away. I basically tell them what they should really be paying attention to and writing down. Um, and my units go in order of number sense, geometry, data and statistics, and then algebra. Um, typically by the time they get to geometry, they don't need a lot of that hand-holding because after listening to me throughout number sense, um, point things out to them, they really start to get it. So I give them the tool right away um, and tell them how to use the tool right away. And yeah, I'm happy to share these. Um, I don't have them on this computer. They're on my work computer, actually. I just shared a couple of them with my personal email, but I can definitely share that out to folks. Um, I, I'm gonna go all the way to the beginning. Sorry if this gives anybody a headache to look at. My email's right here. Please feel free to email me if there's a specific resource you want or need. Um, I'm, I'm pretty responsive on email, so you'll hear back from me for sure. If you ask for something, I can vouch for that. She is very responsive. I try. <laughs> That's awesome. Any other questions? If you have one, you'll still have time. Uh, if you could go actually to the last slide. 
Sorry to do that again. Nope, you're good. Um, I was, um, I, I just dropped it in the chat oh. too because I realized that that might be the easier way to do things. So oh, I'm just going to scroll and go to your slide here for yeah. you. There just a go. few upcoming events that I wanted to highlight. Next week, ne exactly a week from now, um, next Tuesday, we are having a CCRS support webinar called Keys to Unlocking the Treasures of Academic Content. And we're going to have a panel of four uh, teachers from around the state who are gonna share some strategies uh, for unlocking academic content. And, and uh, some several people will be talking too about vocabulary, which pertains to all subjects, right? In, including math as we, as we know. So definitely recommend signing up for that. Um, the Metro Regional uh, is Friday, March 1st, and that will be in person. Um, and next week, registration opens. So I wanted you to be aware of that. And then stay tuned for the MCTM, the Minnesota um, Council for Teachers of Mathematics. The spring conference, uh, Atlas is, uh, traditionally we provide scholarships to help student, or students, to help all of us go to that conference. It's in Duluth, um, it is in person, and we are gonna be able to offer scholarships again this year. So watch the newsletter for more information. Uh, it will, in the next couple weeks or so, uh, we will have information on how to apply for scholarships. So, um, yeah. I just want to say thank you so much, Justine, for putting this together. This is, um, uh, Patsy and I were talking, like this is the, I think the first time we've ever really tackled this topic. And so um, there's just so much to, to learn. So thank you so much for putting this together for us. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and start?